Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rick Trainer. I'm principal of King's College London, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this very unusual event. Um, the unusual nature of it uh, sort of speaks for itself, but in some ways it's a, an event which fits very well into the long-run history and development of King's College London. These days, as many of you know, we cover a, a vast range of subjects. And indeed, we covered a very broad range of subjects going right back to the 1830s. Uh, medicine was an important subject here in those days. Uh, so too uh, were the humanities and many other subjects beside. And in a sense, this event fits into the increasingly productive interrelationship at King's in recent years between um, health care subjects, not least medicine, of course, and the humanities. This event is under the auspices, as you can see, of the Center for Humanities and Health. Um, we've had uh, terrific developments at health at, King, in, uh, at King's in recent years, not least the advent of King's Health Partners. And on the humanities side, we have had a terrific uh, investment recently in the history uh, of medicine, indeed this very term we have imported from another London institution, which shall be nameless for the moment, uh, Center for the History of Science, uh, Technology, and Medicine. So uh, this conjuncture between uh, medicine and the humanities, uh, which in a sense is epitomizes what this event tonight is, is very fitting for kings, both historically and currently. Joseph Lister, of course, was one of the most distinguished academics uh, ever to be at King's College London. And indeed, his pioneering work in surgery is aptly described in his memorial outside the college chapel upstairs as being of, quote, inestimable benefit to mankind, unquote. As the new professor of clinical surgery, Lister gave his inaugural lecture in this room and it was the opening lecture for the new medical school year of 1877. Many people associate Lister with Scotland, and of course a lot of his important work was undertaken in Glasgow and Edinburgh. But he was a London boy, born in 1827 in what was then a little village east of London called Upton, now of course a stop on the district line. His father, Joseph Jackson Lister, was a prosperous wine merchant whose claim to fame was that he invented the achromatic lens. This revolutionized the microscope and had a long-term influence on his son. Last year was the 100th anniversary of Lister's death. Kings marked the occasion by staging a three-locale conference in London. At King's, at the Royal Society, where Lister was president, and at the Royal College of Surgeons of England, where he was vice president. Those meetings in 2012 attracted a multidisciplinary group of scholars who demonstrated how vital and continuing is the interest in Lister, not only on the part of historians of surgery, but also by working surgeons, scholars of patient safety, infection, and nursing, and historians of Lister's worldwide influence. Although Lister had a distinguished surgical and professional career in two Scottish universities, I'm proud to say, I hope this is true, that King's was the only institution to have had the foresight to recruit him by personal invitation. I'm pleased to welcome this distinguished audience, and I'm particularly happy to see so many members of the Lister family here tonight. I hope everyone will enjoy the rest of the evening and join me later for a toast to our eminent lecturer. But I'm now going to hand over to our chairman, Brian Herowitz, the doily Cart Professor of Medicine and the Arts at King's. Brian has done a huge amount for medical humanities at King's, including some special attention to the role of dramatic performances in medical education. So he's an especially appropriate person to tell us more about this evening's reenactment of Lister's inaugural lecture. Please join me in welcoming Brian. Thank you very much, Sir Rick. Uh, 
We're here tonight to listen to Joseph Lister's inaugural lecture, given in this hall 136 years ago, almost to the day. As we've heard, Lister moved to uh, London from Edinburgh in September 1877 and gave this talk on the 1st of October. King's College Hospital then stood only 100 yards northeast. And this is a picture of uh, the original King's College Hospital. It was actually built in the late 1830s, opened in 1840. And you can see that there's a little bit of crescent ground in front of it. This is the front entrance. It was actually on a plot between um, Lincoln's Inn Fields and uh, um, the, the plot of land in Lister's time that was to become the uh, Royal uh, Courts of Justice. And you can see here, this is King's, where we're situated now, and this is uh, the original Drury Lane coming straight the way down into uh, the Strand, literally just north of uh, King's. Um, Before we hear the address, a word or two more about how this occasion comes about. So Rick has mentioned last year's Learning from Lister conference, which had an accompanying exhibition in the Special Collections Unit of the Morn Library. Both attracted very uh, good audiences, several international members of whom are here tonight. We had a range of excellent speakers. One from as far away as Boston is in attendance here too. And the Royal Society's journal notes and records has collected together some of the best conference papers in a special issue devoted to continuing Lister scholarship, copies of which I'm delighted to say will be available later. One of these papers concerns Lister's inaugural lecture and its author, Dr. Ruth Richardson, is here to tell you more about the historical context of Lister's address. Ruth. Well, what an honour it is to be here to speak to all of you. What a lovely, lovely audience. Um, so now, someone who first encountered Joseph Lister in his prime described him as a handsome gentleman, of fine stature and with a gracious smile. And I hope that when our Lister stands up to speak in a few minutes, it's, it's about 15 minutes, I've got a short lecture to give you, I hope you'll agree that we found an equally gracious and handsome stand-in in, in Sean O'Callaghan. My role today is to explain the historical context of Lister's lecture, the great, Lister, the great lecture he gave here in 1877. And so to, I have to do two things in the next 15 to 20 minutes, which, first of all, to remind you briefly of the era in which the lecture was given, and then to explain why it was so significant. So I want you to think yourself back to 1877. Okay. When Lister was first invited to come here as Professor of Clinical Surgery, Queen Victoria had been on the throne for 40 years, and she had another quarter century to run. That year, Disraeli proclaimed her Empress of India. Gilbert and Sullivan's first major work, The Sorcerer, was first staged in 1877, and HMS Pinafore followed. The Crimea had been a quarter century previously, the Great War almost more than that in, in the future. The Albert Hall was very new and shiny. The Strand Law Court's foundations were, were laid, but the building wasn't up. The Thames Embankment and Bazalgette's great sewer system for London was just underway, but not yet, near, not yet complete. London had no Aldwych, no Kingsway, no Tower Bridge. So can you think of London like that? An underground railway ran from Hammersmith to Aldgate, but as yet there was no inner circle, and all the trains were run on steam. Dickens and Thackeray were dead. Oscar Wilde was still at university. George Eliot, Trollope and Hardy were at the height of their powers, Robert Louis Stevenson just starting out. So that, that's the context that we're, we're in. Lister's biography, Rickman Godley, says that the audience here in the Great Hall that October day were not only students, but many doctors and some followers of pure science. 
the college faculty and visitors from the Medical and Scientific Societies of London who had turned out to welcome Lister um, on, the, on his arrival, his, his establishment in London, had mostly b- been born before the mid-century, before the Great Exhibition of 1851, and most of the students who were in the hall after it. In 1877, Lister was already well known for developing antiseptic surgery. Many in his audience would have been aware that in Germany and in the United States, Lister's work was already very highly regarded and that he'd been greeted in both places with banquets and unprecedented celebrations. He'd published his first major paper on the subject of antisepsis in The Lancet 10 years earlier, 1867, so he'd been at it for a decade in terms of publication, connecting germ theory and his new successful method of surgery, which by the use of carbolic acid as an antiseptic, had a profound and beneficial effect on surgical success. Lister had been of the germ theory school for a long time. We know that he'd searched for bacterial causes in um, an epidemic of hospital gangrene when he was a medical student in 1851, and that he'd used pre-operative skin cleansing for years, long before its importance was recognized or understood. This was because... His dad, as you've heard, was a major microscopist, a major uh, figure in the history of microscopy with this discovery of achromatic lenses. Very, very important figure. So it was a normal subject of, of conversation in their family. But in this case, germ theory was so contentious at this period that even Lister's father, this is in 1867, Lister's father who's who's a fellow of the Royal Society, but he advises Lister not to address germ theory directly. He says, don't talk about it. Just get on with your work proving that antisepsis works. It was just too, it was too contentious to raise. This is, that's in the medical field. But microscopists, and not just microscopists, this is dated 1828, 1828, So it's 50 years before Lister's lecture here. This cartoon, the cartoonist who drew this, William Heath, was perfectly aware of small organisms in London water and the horror anybody looking at a microscope microscope slide would notice at that time. In fact, there there was um, a a very important, one of the shows of London was a thing called the oxyhydrogen microscope, which projected a view of this kind of thing, 14 feet across. And this is in London in the 1820s. So people did have some idea that there were were small things around. Um, Microscopists and others had known for far too long that microorganisms were a poorly understood and neglected area of study. Smallpox vaccination worked, but nobody knew how. They, they hadn't worked that one out. They knew it worked, and they used it, but they didn't know exactly how. Animalculae, which are these little creatures, it's one of those collective nouns, including bacteria, had been suspected as agents of infection for a long time. Um, you'll hear Lister uses the word zymotic, which refers to the idea that infectious and contagious diseases were spread by something unknown, a zyme or leaven, a, a, a ferment, sometimes referred to as a zymotic molecule or a morbific principle. It's something that causes illness, but they don't know what it is. And it's often sneered at nowadays when you hear historians talking about, oh, they believed in miasma. But actually, it's not a bad thing to believe in. Between the 1850s and the 1870s, a sometimes acrimonious debate had been raging concerning the causes of infection. While Pasteur was elaborating the biology of fermentation in his studies of, ye- studies of yeasts, the chemist Liebig and his followers were asserting that the idea of living ferments, of, of actually biological ferments, was nonsense and that they were purely chemical in origin. The leading proponent of this idea in Britain was a, man, a doctor called Charlton Bastian, and I suspect he was in the hall in 1877. I think part of Lister's lecture might have been addressed to him or to people of his beliefs. 
Bastian championed the notion of spontaneous generation, the idea that life originated from inorganic materials, um, from the chemical composition of the human body itself, perhaps, and that the, the organisms that one saw in, in wounds and so on were not causative, but epiphenomena, or harmless concomitants. This is the phrase that was used. These accompaniments of disease processes. They, went, they didn't do any harm. They just lived alongside. Looking back on this idea from what we now know, the argument seems absurd. But at the time, it was very powerfully maintained, and many clever people were convinced by it. It was also very difficult to disprove, and it wasn't until the 18... It wasn't until the 1870s, that's this decade that we're in at the moment, the 1870s, that a series of important proofs scotched the idea altogether. It still took some time to turn the battleship round, but it, the 1870s were key. And the lecture you're going to hear tonight was really the last of those great proofs. There had been a great deal of criticism and hostility by way of resistance to Lister's ideas. Uh, it's not clear why such resistance exists in professions, but it does. And it was especially focused in London at that time. It may be benef beneficial caution in some medical cases, and I'm not against that. But regrettably, in others, such as saline for cholera, local anesthesia, and especially antisepsis in childbirth and surgery, the tardy acceptance of new medical ideas has been a recognized phenomenon. We've seen it in our own time with resistance to the idea that Helicobacter pylori is an ulcer-causing carcinogen. Until Warren and Marshall's work in the 1980s, it too was sort of, uh, thought of as a harmless concomitant by so many people. Lister's antisepsis was probably seen as humbug, I think, too complicated, too fashionable even, as an unpardonable attack on surgical freedom. All these ideas were bandied about at the time. Despite growing evidence of the value of antiseptic surgery, the professional surgical hierarchy in England held off, and it was never given an official trial. At King's College, it had been the physicians who pushed hard for Lister's recruitment, not the surgeons. The surgeons weren't really very happy about it. Now, Timothy Holmes, who was a very big figure in London at the time, he was editor of Gray's Anatomy, and, a, and also of a famous system of surgery, so he was very eminent, um, and also a, a very important figure in the surgical establishment. This is how he phrased his position in a debate with Lister. It's the best articulation I've got of the other side of the argument. Um, he fra this is how he phrased it in a debate with Lister in 1879. And at this stage, I think Holmes knew he was on the losing side. Since Mr. Lister's advocacy of the principles of antisepsis, all surgeons had become to a certain extent antiseptic in practice. But he would not admit that to practice antisepticism required a faith in the germ theory, of which he had never seen any proof. He also demurred to deductions being drawn from continental hospitals where all sanitary rules were set at defiance. One can only think, I think, as Lister and his opponents did about each other, that what was involved here was about belief systems, not about evidence. It's the clash of two big belief systems. Now, Lister's old tutor at uh, University College, John Erickson, was typical of the old school. He was a good, caring surgeon, but he was satisfied with a 25% death rate after major surgery, because 25% seemed a great improvement on the norm back when he himself had been a student, when post-operative death had averaged between 35 and 50%. So you can see he thought things had improved a lot. But Lister knew better still. With antiseptic care, the use of carbolic, hand washing, skin cleansing, instrument dipping, wound irrigation, treated sutures and dressings, and protection from aerial dust, he could treat patients who would have been given up, would have been refused operations, and very often could preserve useful limbs, people, the people who would have died under the old regime. 
and also often preserve useful limbs which would previously have been lost to amputation or people who had been left with injuries and deformities for the rest of their lives. They could have had a, a lifelong suffering of pain and a, a life of pain and suffering if Lister hadn't operated. These are people who, who would have not been properly operated on in the normal regime of things. From Lister's operative records, it's clear that he was able to accomplish ameliorative operations, which in other hands might have been left to take a completely different course, and some of those people would have died. He successfully took on terrible injuries, sustained accidentally, lacerated wounds, compound fractures from road and rail disasters, gunshot wounds, or wounds from industrial machinery, industrial accidents. And he also operated electively, which was unheard of at this time, on long-heeled but mismended fractures and dislocations, crippled elbows, knees and hands, tubercular abscesses, bone infections and tumours. Lister's figures for deaths after emergency surgery were below 10%, for elective surgery below 3%. Elsewhere, such problems were usually left to take their own course. Opening a joint or a tubercular abscess was considered foolhardy because of the, na- the danger of mortal infection. Because antisepsis kept infection at bay, Lister was able to undertake an array of new ameliorative operations with consistently good results. Hostility to Lister's ideas might have been partly because Lister himself sometimes spoke with startling honesty. He offended other doctors on more than one occasion by his straight talk, saying, for example, that major surgery without efficient antisepsis was homicidal. <laughs> you don't say things like that without uh, you know, putting people's backs up. Or that many deaths in childbirth were ascribable to doctors ignorant of antiseptic precautions. Apropos of Timothy Holmes, the quote I, I mentioned earlier, Lister said witheringly later on in the same debate, that he was sometimes ashamed for the scientific credit of his own professional brethren. You'll hear today that at one juncture, for a moment, Lister held back from using an offensive expression. His irritation with those who hedged about antisepsis or kept up the cry of spontaneous generation verged on exasperation because he knew that the lengthy delay in adopting antisepsis caused suffering, lost, cost limbs, and was daily causing deaths. Deaths he knew were mostly avoidable. He was charged on one occasion with enthusiasm, dirty word in the 19th century. Lister accepted that he had spoken warmly, but said defiantly, I regard enthusiasm with reference to the avoidance of death, pain, and calamity to our fellow creatures as a thing not at all to be ashamed of. When Lister and his team, the team he trained in Edinburgh, arrived in London, he brought his team down here with him in 1877. They were shocked to find that in the wards of famous London hospitals, the air was heavy with the odour of suppuration. The shining eye and flushed cheek spoke eloquently of surgical fever. That's one of his students speaking. At King's, they would have to start again to clean the wards and teach the patients and the nursing staff the careful technique which had been the norm in Edinburgh for years. Lister had managed such a transformation twice before, first in Glasgow, then in Edinburgh. Until his colleagues were convinced by his ideas, great was the contrast between Lister's wards and those of other surgeons within the same institution. To students, it was obvious the unpleasant odour, the fever charts, and the high loss of life from hospital diseases were simply not seen in Lister's wards, which were calm and sweet. By the time he'd arrived at King's, Lister had published major work on inflammation. Can you see those, the list? Inflammation, anaesthetics, amputation, blood coagulation, compound fractures, abscesses, antisepsis, antiseptic ligatures, hospital infections, antiseptic surgery, antiseptic wound care. So as friends, foes, skeptics, and unwitting students filed into the Great Hall for the first great lecture of that medical school year, 
the likely expectation was that Lister would talk about the dignity of medicine and surgery and perhaps about his own work on antisepsis. But instead, as you'll shortly hear, he decided to present material that would be educative, not just for the fresh faces in the hall, but to many of the grey beards too. Lister de delivered a clear and simple exposition of the newest developments in a new field which as yet had no name. It would become bacteriology. Though, as you'll hear from Lister himself, he thought of bacteria as resembling fungi, but living. It, he he, he recognised it was related somehow to fungi, but they were living. It, it, it's not got a... The field isn't... You know, microbiology didn't really exist. 1877 was the cusp of acceptance of antisepsis. By 1879, all the surgeons at King's had adopted it, convinced by witnessing his results. That year was also the cusp of discovery in the, in the wider world. Early outliers like Devane for anthrax, Hansen with leprosy, Obermeyer with relapsing fever, and Billroth with streptococcus were soon joined by a host of new investigators. Bacteriological discoveries and confirmations began to arrive thick and fast, especially with new improvements in lenses and lab techniques. Within a decade or so, Ogston would name Staphylococci, that's, uh, I think, 1881, 82. Pasteur would find out how to attenuate vaccines, including the most fearful killer, rabies. Koch would isolate the causative organisms of cholera and of tuberculosis. And Laveron, malaria. Confirmations came from investigators in a variety of countries, from Canada to India. Lister, Lister should rightly be seen, as he was by his own learned contemporaries, as the leading microbiologist between Pasteur and Koch. Pasteur and Koch were two different cohorts, and Lister is there in between the two, and he is a fantastic hinge and connector between the two. And actually, it was through him that the two of them met, through Lister, actually in London. And, and he was crucial, Lister was crucial to an international scientific effort by an international scientific community. Antisepsis was Lister's practical application of microbiological insight. All his practical efforts to make surgery safe received post hoc scientific justification in the lecture you're going to hear tonight. Lister didn't know until 1878 the excitement his King's Lecture had caused in France. I'm sure it caused excitement elsewhere, but this we've got documentation for. Writing to his brother in the following year, Lister explained that Dr. de Moussy, who was physician to Louis Philippe, had told him, my introductory lecture at King's, which he saw in the British Medical Journal, had made his heart beat, and he went off at once with it to Louis Pasteur. So you can get a feeling of the excitement, the reports of these things generated. That beating of the heart is something I experienced when I realized that the first pure bacterial culture in the world to be publicly demonstrated was it done in this room in 1877 by Joseph Lister. And it was the, that awareness, that, the awareness that it deserved some acclamation that's brought us all here this evening. Now, Lister used domestic... Oh, sorry, that's the introductory address as it appeared in the, in the British Medical Journal. Lister used domestic wine glasses as receptacles for his culture media. This was because the Petri dish had not yet been invented. His glass garden, what he called a glass garden, was an incubator for bacteria. When he speaks of purifying equipment by heat, we'd call it sterilizing. His hot box is what we'd call an autoclave. Other people have since been credited. Now, just a minute, let me catch up with myself. Those are his glasses. And this, these are from his commonplace books. That's his hot box. Other people have been credited with the development of the micro pipette. In fact, it's uh, patented in the 20th century by somebody. But you'll hear Lister devised one in, in the 1870s for these very experiments. When he describes what is now known as limiting dilution, the limiting dilution method of isolating individual bacteria you should know that this was Liston's own extraordinary invention. The great commonplace books 
which Lister, in which Lister and his wife Agnes recalled all his experiments, survive today in the Royal College of Surgeons in Lincoln's Inn. So too do many of his test tubes and covered glasses and other apparatus. You can see some of them in the Science Museum and others in the Royal College. Extraordinarily, even the actual posters which he used during his lecture survive to this day in the Royal College. But because of their rarity and fragility and the logistics involved, we've decided to show some of them as slides during the restaging. So this is a hybrid event. We know we haven't really got Professor Lister here, but we've got a very good imitation. And you'll have to um, pay very close attention because, uh, first of all, we ask you to imagine the equipment. So you've got to use one part of your brain for that in the appropriate places when our Professor Lister speaks of them as if they really were there between you and, and him. Um, we're also very fortunate that the full script of Lister's lecture also survives, not just the printed version. This is a, a shorthand writer's version of the lecture. There was a shorthand writer in the hall that day, and he was taking it down for the British Medical Journal, word for word, as Lister was speaking. And what's so splendid. It's published within a week of the lecture, pretty much word for word. There's a few things missing. But nowadays, it's available online. Um, and Lister evidently asked if he might keep the transcript after publication. And it was preserved amongst his pa papers at his death. The original lecture took well over an hour to deliver. So we've edited the meat of it down to half that. Okay, so it's very condensed, and that means you've got to pay very careful attention, otherwise you might miss something. Okay? Lister liked to digress, and he often emphasized the most important points by repetition, and it's some of these, we've, we've taken out the digressions and we've taken out some of the repetitions. So we haven't taken out anything germane to the lecture at all, but it is very condensed. Now, because we've got the full transcript, we know that despite what one of his students saw as a battle cry in hostile London, Lister was in fact applauded at various junctures during this lecture, and that he sat down at the end amid loud applause. I've just got... That, that's what it looks like, and, and the, the visiting card of the shorthand writer is up there, as well as the first page. And I don't know if you can see this at the back, but these are scrambling deletions under those deletions it says applause 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 and those are only three examples there are, there's more places where that he was heavily applauded um, Lister deliberately used ordinary examples in his lecture very ordinary things and he used a very simple model model organism so anyone could ponder at home what he had demonstrated in such a clear and reasoned manner Yet wine, blood, and milk, at which are the liquids he addresses, all hold other powerful resonances. And I think you have to think about that too as he's talking. The wine was from Italy, the blood from, ox in an Edinburgh, from an ox in an Edinburgh slaughterhouse, the milk from a cow named Blackie at a dairy on Edinburgh's Corstorphin Road. The lecture allowed him I've got a picture, not of Blackie, but of a lovely creature and his partner, and her partner. Um, the lecture allowed Lister to lock horns with those too ignorant of the science to recognize its importance or appreciate its application. Those with an interest in the field would have recognized immediately that Lister, by dexterous and ingenious experimentation, scientific precision and reasoning chemical, biological and mathematical had cleared away the cobwebs of antiquated thought and had reached an elegant, telling and highly significant endpoint. For the duration of the lecture, he had an audience of listeners and this was what he wanted them to hear. <laughs> 
Gentlemen, in making my first appearance as teacher at King's College, I cannot refrain from expressing my deep sense of the honor conferred upon me by the invitation to occupy the chair which I now hold. And at the same time, my earnest hope that the confidence thus reposed in me will not be misplaced. In considering how I could best discharge my duty as the person selected to deliver the introductory address of the medical session, I have felt that two courses were open to me. Either to spend a short but important time at my disposal in an endeavor to convey to the student some of the exalted privileges and correspondingly high responsibilities of his beneficent calling. Or, if possible, to teach some instruction to the student and possibly to the eminent people and men that I now see around me. The latter is the course which I have decided to follow and the subject which I have selected is a short account of an inquiry in which I have been engaged in the interval between the cessation of my official duties in Edinburgh and their commencement here. The object of that investigation was to obtain, if possible, some positive and definite knowledge of the essential nature of a class of phenomena which, which, which interest alike both the surgeon, the physician, and the accoucheur. I allude to the changes in organic substances which are designated by the general term fermentation. In medicine, the large class of diseases termed zymotic derive their fame from the hypothesis that their essential nature is fermentative. In obstetrics, the great cause of disaster after childbirth, puerperal fever, is now regarded by many of the highest authorities as likewise due to fermentative disorder. In surgery, among the various causes which may disturb a wound, we know that by far the most frequent in operation and the most pernicious agent in its effects, both upon the wounded part and upon the constitution, is putrefactive fermentation. If this be so, it is clear that to understand the nature of fermentation must be a matter of the very highest importance. What then do we mean by fermentation? I shall best approach the answer to this question by giving an example. Rather more than a week ago, I witnessed in north of Italy a time on a practice of treading the grapes in the wine vat. I was told that within 24 hours, the juice would be overflowing in the vat, as it was said. In other words, this conversion of the sugar of the grape into alcohol and carbonic acid gas is accompanied by the development of a microscopic organism, the yeast plant, or to continue the old nomenclature, torula, consisting of microscopic cells multiplying by pollination as indicated in this rough diagram. Now, gentlemen, it is, I believe, universally admitted that the alcoholic fermentation of grape sugar is due to the growth of the yeast plant. Monsieur Pasteur thinks that he has traced the origin of the yeast plant in the juice of the grape to a, a minute fungus adhering to the outside of the skin of the grape. So long as the juice of the grape is protected by the skin of the berry, no fermentation occurs. But as soon as it escapes from the protection, the organism, by its development, induces the fermentation. We have an active agent termed the ferment, which is capable of self-multiplication. That I believe to be the essential property of true fermentation. There is an active principle termed the ferment, which ferment has the faculty of self-multiplication. 
are all true fermentations caused by the development of organisms? That, gentlemen, is the question which it is desirable that we should find the answer. Take, for example, the case of putrefactive fermentation of blood. We all know that if blood be shed from the body into any vessel without special precautions, in a few days it putrefies. The bland, nutritive liquid soon after leaving its natural receptacle becomes foul, acrid, and poisonous. A change full as striking as the change which sugar undergoes in alcoholic fermentation. Now, gentlemen, here we have a glass into which blood was received with special precautions. In the first place, the glass covered, as you see, with a glass cap and a glass shade with the view of preventing the access of dust. And standing upon a piece of plate glass and heated to a temperature of about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And cooled with an arrangement which ensured that the air which entered during the cooling was filtered of its dust so that we knew that the glass contained no living organisms. The jugular vein of an ox was exposed with precautions against the entrance of anything putrefactive. And the cotton cap having been taken off from the end of the tube, the jugular vein was slipped over the tube and tied on. Then the hand of the assistant, who previously restrained the flow of blood, being relaxed, the blood was permitted to flow into the flask. The point which I wish to draw your special attention to, is that this blood, although it has been six weeks in this glass without any close fitting of the glass shade or the glass cap, has not putrefied. The air under the shade is perfectly sweet, perfectly free from odour, as it was in the first instance. Now, gentlemen, this, without going any further, is a very important matter. It proves that blood has no inherent tendency to putrefaction. It further proves that oxygen of the air is not able to cause the blood to putrefy, as used to be supposed. Gentlemen, if I were to take a little morsel of already putrefied blood, and say upon the, the end of a needle, and uh, touch it with the uh, clot of blood, putrefaction would in a very short course of time spread throughout the mass, exactly as in the case of alcoholic fermentation, under the influence of a yeast plant, would the fermentation spread. Putrefaction, then, is a true fermentation, characterized by the power of self-propagation of the ferment. Then, gentlemen, if we examine microscopically, we find in the putrefied blood, as we found in the fermented grape juice, microscopic organisms termed bacteria from their rod shape which we have here is represented on the same scale as we have the yeast plant. They are of different sizes, very much more minute than the yeast plant, and commonly endowed with a remarkable power of locomotion. I say that in the putrefying blood we find these organisms developing pari passu with the fermentation. Now, the question is, are these bacteria the cause of the putrefying fermentation, or are they merely accidental concomitants? Gentlemen, these are two views which are entertained at the present day by men of high evidence. It may be said, why should there be any doubt that the bacteria are the cause of the putrefactive fermentation any more than there is doubt that the yeast 
is the cause of the alcoholic. Well, one reason I believe to be that the bacteria are so exceedingly small, they are not so easily defined. We cannot get them in a mass as we can get a mass of yeast, at least without a great deal of trouble. Besides that they occur very similar in appearances in a great number of different fermentations. But, although we have no evidence of the kind on record, we have persons of high authority maintaining that probably, in putrefactive fermentation, bacteria are merely accidental concomitants. That the real essential agent in the putrefaction is not an organism at all, but some so-called chemical ferment, destitute of life. I say, as long as we have authorities maintaining such a view, it is necessary to test its truth or falsehood by searching inquiry. It is our duty, if we can, to disprove it. It has been with this object that my investigations of the last two months have been conducted. Well, gentlemen, the special process of fermentation which I have been investigating has not been the putrefactive, but one which seemed to me more convenient for the purpose. The lactic fermentation, the fermentation by the means of which milk sours and curdles. The sugar of milk, instead of being converted as grape sugar into alcohol, and carbonic acid is converted into lactic acid. A curious instance of a chemical alteration. The chemical composition as regards the proportions of the three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, remain identically the same. But those of you who are chemists understand me when I say that the weight of the lactic acid is a quarter of the atomic weight of the sugar of milk. Each atom has been resolved into four simple atoms of lactic acid. Now, gentlemen, it may be naturally supposed, if you, were, if you observe what happens in a portion of milk obtained from a dairy, that the, the souring and the curdling is the absolute inherent tendency of the milk. You might be tempted to suppose that those were changes to which the milk was disposed from its own inherent properties, as it came from the cow's udder. The late eminent professor of chemistry from, chemistry from this college, Professor Miller, in his excellent work on chemistry, states that the ferment of the lactic acid is the casein of the milk. Others have thought that exposure to oxygen is behind these changes. But it was pointed out long ago by Monsieur Pasteur that if you examine any specimen of souring milk with the microscope, you find little organisms in it, and when you look at them carefully, you find that they are obviously of the nature of bacteria. Bacteria may either have the faculty of motion or they may not. This particular bacterium is a motionless bacterium, as far as I know. Still, it has the essential nature of a bacterium to multiply by fissiparous generation, by splitting across the longitudinal axis of the organism. I have ventured to give this little organism the term Bacterium lactis. For gentlemen, undoubtedly, there are different kinds of bacteria. The mere fact that they are minute must not make us shut our eyes to this fact. You sometimes hear bacteria spoken of as if they were all alike. Now, the fact that some do not move and some do move is one indication 
of that difference. Another indication of a difference is that some bacteria will thrive in a substance in which others will not. For instance, the bacterium lactis refuses to live at all, according to the more careful examinations I have been lately making, in Pasteur's solution. That very liquid, fluid, provided by Mr. Pasteur for bacteria to live in. That is a medium in which the bacterium lactis refuses to grow at all. Although the majority of bacteria grow in it with rapidity. That is perfectly clear evidence that this is a different kind of bacterium from those which both move and thrive in Pasteur's solution. You will observe also, it is somewhat peculiar in the formation of the segments. They are oval and not so rod-shaped as bacteria generally are. These you will always find when milk is in the early stages of souring. Now, gentlemen, let me show you this flask. It is a flask of boiled milk, prepared on the 27th of August. It has not coagulated. It has undergone none of the changes to which I have alluded. There has been no souring, no curdling, no fermentation, no putrefaction. The milk is as sweet as when it was first prepared. From this same flask, with precautions, with which I will not detain you, I have charged various glasses. This has been charged for weeks, and yet the milk remains fluid, you observe. Although there is abundantly free access of air, the oxygen of the air and the casein which still exists in the boiled milk have together been unable to bring about the lactic fermentation. As regards boiled milk, then, we have already sufficient evidence that the lactic fermentation is not something to which the boiled milk is spontaneously prone. It requires something to be introduced into it from without. If you would take such a glass as this and dip the point of a needle into a glass of soured milk and touch with the needle's point the edge of the milk, within two or three days it would be a sour clot. Then you should find, as certainly as I did, the bacterium lactis present throughout the mass. But gentlemen, it may be urged, and such arguments have been used, this may be very well for boiled milk. But how about unboiled milk? May it not be that by boiling the milk you have uh, destroyed certain chemical substances, or well, purely hypothetical, we must admit, but which we do think likely? It is very difficult sometimes to uh, avoid an offensive expression. But it may be, according to the view of some persons, that in the well, unboiled milk there may exist certain chemical substances prone to evolve into organisms by spontaneous generation and prone to produce these and, and other fermentations with which, by the act of boiling, we deprive of this tendency. Therefore, gentlemen, with a view of meeting this objection, the first part of my investigation was devoted to endeavouring to see whether or not milk, as it comes from the cow, really does or does not contain materials in it tending spontaneously to the development of organisms or to fermentation of any kind. <laughs> Gentlemen, an exceedingly simple experiment will probably serve to convince you to a considerable extent 
with regard to this matter. If you go to a dairy, where there is also a cow house, and take a couple of clean bottles with you, if you please, and fit one with milk from the dairy, and the other with milk direct from the cow in the cow house. The milk obtained from the dairy will be certain to sour, but the milk you get direct from the cow will very probably never sour at all. It will acquire a nasty, bitter taste and will not have the bacterium lactis, but some other kind of fungi altogether. That simple experiment is sufficient to show at all events that the lactic acid fermentation is not a change which milk is spontaneously prone to. It occurred to me that if he were to take more care in the experiment and also perform the experiment so as to take the milk into the pure vessels previously purified by heating, we might be able to get the milk not only without the lactic acid fermentation or the bacterium lactis, but without any fermentation or any sort of organism. Accordingly, I arranged a number of little glasses like these and little test tubes with covers arranged upon a stand of glass, tube, and silver wire. These were put into the hot box and heated to a temperature of about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And then some milk having been received from the cow into a vessel purified by heat, milk was drawn up into this pipette, also purified by heat. And then each little cap being raised in succession, a few minims of milk were introduced into each of the glasses, the caps being immediately reapplied. Ladies well, and gentlemen, the result was every one of the milks underwent fermentation. Every one of them. And every one of them contained organisms. Some of them as many as, I thought, three different ones. Oh, you will not find fault with the nature, gentlemen. The great majority of these 12 classes which I used presented little orange specks, such as were never seen, I suppose, in any milk before. And on examining these, I found them to be little organisms, which I ventured to give the name granuligera, because they consist of granules. They are different from the bacteria in this respect that you might not suppose them to be organisms at all until you saw them undergoing multiplication by fission. They multiply crosswise, not like bacteria. But besides these, there was also some yeast, but there was no bacterium, lactic acid, and no lactic acid was formed. Now, gentlemen, what inference are we to draw? Are we to suppose that although the lactic acid fermentation had been excluded, it was impossible to exclude others? That others existed in, in the milk in the cow's udder? Or was it that I had not been sufficiently careful? The latter was the view I was disposed to take. The experiment had been performed in the cow house where certainly the air might be supposed to be reeking with organisms. I therefore performed the experiment a second time, and this time in the open air. It must be confessed, it was not far from the cowhouse, and it was a fine day in the very part of the year in which organisms most abound. I had this time 24 of the little glasses which you see before you. This time again, did every glass have organisms in it? Every glass seemed to be different from all the rest. Such fermentation as there are here, gentlemen, I venture to say were never seen in the world before. 
for you here a diagram showing on a, on a somewhat large scale what I was uh, particularly to direct, I want to particularly direct your attention to these strange scarlet spots which occurred in almost all of them. They began in tiny scarlet dots which spread as fermentative changes and therefore capable of self-multiplication in the substance of the milk. Here is one that is green, and here is another of an orange-yellow color. Here are two that have two kinds of filamentous fungi in them. I have not yet examined the species, but I shall very likely find that it is some kind that I have not described. But gentlemen, how are we to explain these strange appearances? I was still disposed to believe that these organisms had got in for want of sufficient care on my part, but how? How are we to explain these appearances? Simply thus, gentlemen, that if the bacterium lactis had been here, it would have taken precedence over all the other organisms in its development. And the changes which it would have introduced would have made the milk an unfit soil for these organisms. Well, gentlemen, I determined to make one more attempt. It occurred to me that the one cause of my failure might be this. In a former experiment in the cowhouse, the great majority had orange spots, and those, as we have seen, were composed of heaps of granules. Supposing, supposing one single group of these granules to exist and to have become disturbed and broken up, it might vitiate the whole specimen of the milk. Therefore, instead of drawing up the milk into the pipette with a syringe and then expelling it, I determined upon having it introduced as directly as I possibly could into the little glasses. I took glass vessels like these, which had been purified by heat. Cotton caps were tied over the ends of the glasses during the heating. The cow was taken out again into the open air. And this day, the elements were in my favor. It had been drizzling all morning, and I might fairly hope that some of the multitudes of organisms might be washed away in the little orchard, and that the air might have been purified. This time, gentlemen, I was also more careful in this respect. I got the dairy woman to wash her hands with water and the cow's udder also. And she, having squirted a little milk to wash away the organisms from the orifice, she did what, what dairy women can. She milked the milk from the cow directly into these little glasses. So they were filled with as little disturbance as possible of the organisms that might be supposed to be introduced in spite of my care. Now, gentlemen, it is six weeks since this was done. At first sight, you would suppose, contrasting these appearances with those of the other tubes, that these latter milks were all pure. But the truth is, gentlemen, that all but two have organisms in them. But two days ago, I drew out milk from one of the two that seemed to be still pure. And I had the greatest satisfaction in finding the milk not only perfectly fluid, but tasting perfectly sweet, and with a perfectly normal reaction. Both the blue litmus paper and the red litmus paper purpled. The normal reaction of perfectly fresh milk. And under the microscope, I could not discover any organism of any kind whatsoever. Therefore, gentlemen, I think we are justified in saying that with unboiled milk, as with boiled, provided, of course, the cow be healthy, there does not exist in milk any constituent having any power of giving rise to organisms or producing the lactic or any other fermentative change. 
That gentleman is the first step. The second will not occupy us so long. And I respect very earnestly of you that you will give me the opportunity of mentioning it because I believe you will agree by far that it is the most important of the two. It's, I'm sorry. Sorry. Excuse me. Sorry to detain you beyond the hour. And I, I'm sorry that anything I say should be wearisome to any gentleman here. But I beg him, for the sake of others that may have some interest in what is going on, to, uh, to refrain from giving evidence of his weariness. <laughs> the second part of my investigation was to find absolute evidence, if possible, whether the bacterium lactis was or was not the cause of the lactic fermentation. It occurred to me that if we could estimate with some degree of accuracy the number of bacteria present in a given quantity of the liquid, and then if we were to dilute the milk with a proportionate quantity of boiled water, we might have the diluted milk so arranged that every drop with which we should inoculate the milk might contain, on average, one bacteria. Well, how are we to determine the number of bacteria existing in the liquid? That was done in a simple enough manner. A little microscope covering glass, just half an inch in diameter, was used. Of course, we know how many square thousands of an inch there are, in the area of this little glass. I knew there was 150th of a minimum under the covering glass. If then I counted how many bacteria there were in a number of different fields and struck the average, by calculation I knew how much boiled water I ought to add in order that one drop of the milk and water solution should contain, on average, one bacterium, and one only. I found that it was needful to add no less than one million parts of boiled water to the milk to ensure that there should be rather less than one bacterium on the average to one drop. Then, with these drops, I inoculated five glasses of boiled milk. Gentlemen, the result was that out of the five, only one curdled. But one did curdle. And that one had the bacterium lactis in abundance. The others did not curdle, underwent no fermentation whatsoever, and had no bacterium in them. You may say, gentlemen, how was it that you did not have one of these numerous different kinds that you have been showing us? Simply for this reason. That the dilution had been made with reference to the bacterium lactis and not with reference to the exceedingly small quantities of other organisms. Thus, as far as I can judge, I have got my ferment pure. Having got it pure, I could perform other experiments. And gentlemen, the last experiment I have to mention to you is this. With a view to this occasion, I had the milk in 20 vessels fitted for transportation. Each of these specimens which you see before you were inoculated. Five each with a drop calculated to contain two, five with four bacteria and five tubes and five open glasses with a drop calculated to contain, on average, one bacterium per drop. The result was the specimen with a drop calculated to contain four bacteria curdled. And all these five calculated to have two bacteria to a drop curdled in a few days. The milk you see is perfectly solid and curdled and soured. You will observe 
that no other change has taken place except the lactic fermentation, no other alteration. I may here mention that although all these coagulated, they did not all coagulate at the same time. Of the five glasses calculated to have one bacterium to each inoculating drop, three have remained fluid and two of these others in the tubes, so that of the ten, exactly five, as it so happens, have remained fluid without curdling. I may consider myself somewhat fortunate that I have succeeded in bringing these all the way from Edinburgh in this condition. I will now, gentlemen, deprive this of the protection which it has hitherto lived in. It is perfectly sweet. If any gentleman here would like to uh, have a taste, he may do so. There's no need to worry. I've drunk from one side of the glass. <laughs> I went through the laborious process of investigating portions of all these vessels. And I found that in every one in which the lactic acid fermentation had taken place, where there was curdling and souring, the bacterium lactis was present. And in no instance in which there was no lactic fermentation was any bacterium of any sort to be discovered. I believe that demonstrates that the bacterium lactis is the cause of this very special lactic fermentation. But let us assume for a moment that there did exist some other particles besides bacterium lactis in the milk capable of causing fermentation. That the the, the, the lactic fermentation were, were not the bacterium at all, but some chemical ferment. First of all, you will please observe that we have from the experiment absolute evidence that the ferment of whatever nature it may be is not in solution, but in the form of suspended insoluble matters. If the ferment had been in solution, then every drop would have produced the same effect. The fact that some drops were destitute of the ferment proves that the ferment was not in a state of solution. That is absolutely demonstrated. Now, gentlemen, suppose we admit, for the sake of argument, that the lactic acid ferment was some, some non-living substance, capable of self-multiplication as rapidly as, as bacteria, but not living. A hypothesis, no doubt, but, but suppose we admit it. I say, gentlemen, suppose we admit that the chemical lactic ferment and the bacterium lactis were, were merely small, accidental concomitants of each other. It would be absolutely inconceivable that these two accidentally present things should be present in exactly the same number. But gentlemen, Suppose you admit that there were exactly as many of the bacterium lactis as there were of the fermentative matter. I say it would be, again, inconceivable that they should accompany one another in pairs. That invariably where there was bacterium lactis, there should be a ferment particle. And where there was no bacterium lactis, no ferment particle. 
That would be as inconceivable as the other. Therefore, we have two inconceivable things, one of which would have been sufficient to show that we cannot admit any other hypothesis other than that bacterium lactis is the cause of the lactic acid fermentation. Now, gentlemen, the experiment tends to even more than this. Where we find the effect so exactly proportionate as regards the number of glasses affected by the fermentation to the adult bacteria that we count, we are led to infer that this particular bacterium has not got any spores that there are no spores existing in addition to the bacteria. People seem often to assume that these bacteria must necessarily have spores or germs. It seems to me an unlikely thing that they should because they are generative apparatus per se. They are constantly multiplying. Why should they have spores? I do not say that bacteria may not have spores. There are different kinds of bacteria, and some may have spores, and some may not. But this sort of result seems to indicate that this particular bacterium has no spores. If we had, besides the bacteria that we count, spores of bacteria disseminated throughout the liquid we should have the effect more than in proportion to those bacteria that we have. Gentlemen, I venture to urge upon you that you will seriously ponder the facts which I have had the honor of bringing before you today. If you do so, I believe you will agree with me that we have absolute evidence that the bacterium lactis is the cause of lactic acid fermentation. And thus, I venture to believe that we have taken one sure step in the way of removing this important but most difficult question from the region of vague speculation and loose statement into the domain of precise and definite knowledge. Thank you for that splendid and thought-provoking lecture, which I'm sure we'll all ponder. I'm reminded of the words of Thomas Wharton, the 18th century poet, who, when confronted with the thoughts of an influential writer from what he termed the remote past, said, it is necessary that we should place ourselves in his situation, so we may the better be enabled to judge and discern how his turn of thinking and manner of composing was biased, influenced, and, as it were, tinctured by the very familiar and reigning appearances which are so utterly different from these of the present time. We've gained a vivid sense tonight of the conceptual issues with which a distinguished surgeon at the forefront of his practice and science was grappling in the latter half of the 19th century. Of his thinking, experimentalism, and intellectual tools that he brought to bear on fundamental questioning. Though remote from the language and procedures of today's clinical and scientific research, Lister's influence on current thinking and practice is apparent. We note especially his various yet meticulous investigation of biological fluid, for evidence of endogenous or exogenous microbial life. The combination of direct and microscopic visualization, dilution, and semi-quantitative reasoning, which he brings to his procedures. His repeated and determined attempts to explain failure as well as success in de demonstrating experimental findings. 
and his demonstration of a dose-response effect and what we would now refer to as bacterial inhibition of other organisms. Though remote from the vocabulary and materials of today's scientific research, Lister's thinking and method nevertheless have tinctured indelibly current microbiological science and surgical practice. This is a conclusion filled out very interestingly and in detail in the Lister issue of Notes and Records of the Royal Society on sale here, and which supplements existing historical scholarship on Lister's work. If you've already paid for a copy, please let Sabrina Beck and Maria Vaccarella, who are on the desk, know. If you wish to purchase a copy at the greatly reduced price of £10, I'm assured it usually costs about £30, uh, please do so. Tonight's lecture, therefore, marks the culmination of a successful anniversary conference with a publication that makes a significant contribution to continuing studies into Lister and Listerism and its ongoing worldwide importance today. It only remains for me to thank our medical students for their part in the evening's procedures. Please join us in the foyer in raising a glass to Professor Joseph Lister. Thank you.